Okay, so let's uh, let's go for it. So, um, thanks everyone for coming along. Um, this is obviously a first for most of us, and uh, possibly uh, one of the first sort of things in Australia, especially with landscape photographers. Um, we the plan for tonight is we tend to, uh, we'll um, you know I'll introduce everyone or everyone will introduce themselves and then we'll um, I'll, I'll go through and ask everyone some questions and um, and then we'll take some questions from from everyone uh, from the audience so if you haven't seen the link um, there's a link where you can go to my website and uh, basically you can ask questions there via Facebook or you can uh, also go onto YouTube. Um, there's links all over the place on everyone's uh, Facebook pages, so go to YouTube and you can also ask questions there. I will try and stay across all of them as uh, best as possible. And um, and I'm we'll also trying to get some photos to critique. So, um, and just before I start, um, this moustache is not usually here. Uh, I don't want to be known as a photographer who has a moustache, and especially it's quite a red one. <laughs> um, this is obviously for November, so uh, you know, don't judge me for for this thing on my face. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so um, and we've we've all kind of got uh, surnames and and names that are are slightly difficult to pronounce. Um, I'm Lee Jugud, so my my surname is spelled uh, or pronounced Jugud. Uh, I'm a landscape photographer based in Sydney. Um, I'm sure a lot of you know my work, or if not, you um, you know you've been brought here from someone's Facebook page. So um, this is a great thing we're we're doing. Um, hopefully, we we'll get some something out of it tonight. We've got we've got some tips and everything like that. So um, so Dylan, over to you. Can you just uh, you just tell uh, us about your website, website, and website and what you like shooting? What you like shooting. Okay. Um, my name's. Uh, oh, I think it's got Jerome there. And my name is Dylan Toe, and uh, it's my wife, uh, Marianne. Uh, together we've badged ourselves as Envelope Photography. Um, our primary interest is in landscapes, um, but uh, we have been shooting the odd wedding here and there for the last few years now. And uh, Marianne in particular was wanting to get uh, set up in pet photography. Um, I think we really like the stuff of wet nose photos, so that's kind of an inspiration for that. Um, we're based in Adelaide. Sorry, is that the guy? Is that the guy with the dog again? The water. The water. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. So we're based in um, Adelaide, and most of our shots uh, are taken when we have a very limited time of annual leave when we go on holiday somewhere together. Um, so at the moment, um, we're still uh, working professionals, me in the healthcare profession, and Marianne in the animal care profession, I guess you could say. Um, and we're probably going to keep it that way for quite some time. So um, that's a little bit of a nutshell. In terms of um, the kind of gear that we use, um, both of us are Canon people. Um, we recently got the 5D Mark III and Marianne's um, 5D Mark II. Um, we use uh, mainly the wide angle lenses, so the 16 to 35 and the 17 to 40. And some of our landscapes, we use um, the 70 to 200 and the teleconverter for that as well. Um, we love Gipso tripods and we don't leave anywhere without them. And we hold, have a whole set of filters from all sorts of uh, different um, companies like Lee, Singray, and so forth. And we also love our GNDs and use them kind of religiously wherever we go too. So, so which, um, which um, uh, Sorry, what was that? What, 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 what neutral lens find yourself using? Uh, we have um, some screw on 9 stop and 10 stop neutral densities. And um, in terms of uh, the GNDs, um, we have uh, a four-stop soft, a couple of um, three-stop hards and three reverses, three soft, two soft, and I think that's probably the kit between the two of us. What's the brand? What's the brand? Can you guys hear him? No, I can't hear. No, same. Dylan. Oh, sorry. Um, that's better. Um, yes. The screw-on filters, one of them is Vader, 
and the other one is a Heliopan three stop. Uh, sorry, 3.0, so it's equivalent to 10 stop. And um, the GNDs, there's a whole assortment of them depending on when we replace them, but there's a combination of Lee and Singray and high tech all in there. In, in, and they swap out between our filter pouches depending on uh, who's going out and shooting what. Cool, cool. All right, thanks all very right, much. Thanks very much. room, room. Yeah, so hi, so my name is uh, Jerome Berbiger. I've got a very difficult um, family name, hard to pronounce, especially for Australians. Um, I'm originally from France. I moved to Australia back in 2007, uh, 2008. That's pretty much when I started photography. I'm now Sydney based, uh, and uh, as well, I, I still have my uh, day work, like a few of us. And then I shoot mostly on weekends and try to go overseas as often as I can. Uh, in terms of gear, I use a uh, Nikon D800E. I actually still have two Nikons. I've got a D700 and a D800. Uh, not surprisingly, I'm using, I'm using a lot of filters as well, so uh, mostly from uh, Lee. Um, I've tried Singray, but um, I, I, be, I quickly came back to Lee, so definitely my favorite brand. Uh, I actually don't have that much gear. I shoot pretty much everything wide angle, so I do a lot of landscape photography, obviously. <laughs> And then I think my, my favorite piece of gear so far is probably my uh, tripod, which is a really right stuff tripod. And that sounds kind of uh, bizarre, but uh, that kind of changed my, uh, my way of shooting. So yeah, probably my favorite piece so far. Your way of shooting? Like you can carry it around or something? <laughs> well, yeah, you have to, yeah. I mean, hard, hard to carry it around because it's quite a massive piece of uh, carbon and metal. But um, way of shooting because it's really, really stable and you can kind of you know, stop and I don't know, it's just it's very a lot easier to shoot. Um, I, I see a lot of people in workshops that you know come out with quite expensive gear, um, very heavy cameras and you know crappy tripods and uh, I think it's it's a big plus to have a good tripod. Cool. Um, so Kakit, what about you? Uh, okay, my name is Kakit Jung. I'm Melbourne based but don't seem to spend much time there. Um, I've I've got a medical background, but uh, been pretty much full time most of uh, 2012. I cool. use Canon 5D Mark II. So I've got two bodies, none of which are operational <laughs> at the moment. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've I've got kind of like two setups. I've got my travel setup, which is lighter, um, and also my heavier landscape setup. So I've got two tripods, um, usually got like a fast and a slower lens, but uh, over the last couple of years I've been trying to merge the two. So currently most of the time I, I still bring my two 5D Mark II bodies 16 to 35 2.8 L, which is actually the Mark I. Um, I've kept that because of the 77 millimeter thread, so I can have um, 77 millimeter polarizers and uh, UV filters for everything. So, um, so the Mark I actually has the 77, not 82, or whatever it is. The the Mark I is is 77, and it's remarkably light for a 2.8 lens. Yeah. So you you can. You compare it to the to the Nikon one, and it, you know, feels far less substantial. Um, and then I've got my 24 to 105 and uh, 70 to 300, uh, which is a 4 to 5.6, also an L lens. And that's my basic setup. I usually also bring my 50 millimeter, uh, which is a 1.4, uh, and a 85. Millimeter 1.2. Um, so on my life, yeah, it, it's quite a lot of gear. So it's much easier if I have a single trip and uh, it's all landscape based. In which case, I just bring you know, 1635, um, 24 to 105, and 7300, and uh, my heavier tripod, which is a 2000 series uh, Jitso. Um, if it's all travel, I'll bring the. Uh, I've got a traveler jitsu as well. 
if I've got both, it means I end up carrying a hell of a lot of gear, including two tripods. Did, did you uh, scream out loud when you lost your 5D in the river in New Zealand? Uh, <laughs> I don't. I think I was in shock, actually. Because I, I saw you had it's, photos with the iPad and a, a graduating neutral density filter, and uh, so you didn't have your backup camera, or, or what was the deal um, there? This, this was the one trip that I did not bring a backup on. I, I would normally bring a backup, but my back backup, um, I, I, I cracked in a um, in a portrait shoot. I had my 85 millimeter lens and the 5D in the same bag, and I think I had to I had to break very hard, and um, the 85 smashed into my 5D. Wow. Mm. I, I've never actually lost any gear, and um, I, I forgot to mention what I shoot with. Um, nothing too out of the ordinary, 5D Mark II, um, 17 to 40 uh, L series, and uh, 70 to 200 2.8. Uh, obviously, I kind of, um, you know, the 70 to uh, 200 2.8 is a great sort of portraiture lens, and uh, good for travel and stuff like that, but Really, it's um, a bit heavy for the for lugging around with the landscape stuff. So I kind of wish I'd gone for the the uh, smaller uh, 70 to 200 L series lens. Um, but yeah, I've never lost any gear. I I did go canyoning on the weekend, and uh, and my it seems like my remote release seems to bear the brunt of everything. It was uh, constantly dangling in the water. Um, and actually, you know, it, it was it stopped working and it started to work when it dangled in the water. So um, I don't think you can destroy those things, it seems like. I don't know. Well, no, you can certainly destroy them. I, I think I go through about two a year of those. Uh, uh, do you? Uh, is you that use, the thermometer? Do you use the Canon, um, the, the, the proper Canon uh, remote release? or? Yeah, the in intervalometer is like 300 bucks or something. Oh, yeah, okay. Now I use the cable release. Yeah. Ah, okay, cool. That might be more destructible than yours. <laughs> okay, so, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, really regarding week. Yeah, look, uh, like uh, I'm also Melbourne-based. Just recently uh, moved to Melbourne from Perth, and I've only been in Melbourne probably the last couple of months. And uh, look, I've been using the same camera that I've, for the last four years, and that's a Canon One DS Mark III. Uh, predominantly shoot with uh, 50 mil prime. Uh, Carl Zeiss, uh, but I've also got a 16-35mm uh, uh, in the L series from Canon and also uh, got, uh, I just recently purchased um, a 70-300mm to L series Canon uh, because I'm looking to uh, just change my way of shooting uh, uh, from here on now. Um, yeah, look, I, I work just uh, part-time and uh, I've told myself that uh, next year I really want to try and focus a lot more on the landscape photography uh, thing. I, tend to try and get uh, pulled away into other things and I want to try and start a bit focusing a bit more on the landscape photography. Um, I, uh, I also have two tripods. Uh, I have uh, both Manfrotto. One of them is pretty li uh, fairly light. They're both carbon fibre. One I use to, uh, when I travel on the plane, I find it just nice and compact. I can uh, take it with me on carry-on. Whereas the other one is very, very big, and I tend to just use it when the very rough conditions, very windy, and uh, I usually uh, uh, tug that one along with me. Um, yeah, look, I've uh, just recently moved to Victoria, so looking to uh, uh, try and focus on the Victoria uh, area and as well as the Tasmanian area. I'll be visiting uh, Tasmania quite a bit next year, and also planning a trip to New Zealand. Um, yeah. Uh, about all really. Uh, also filters. Look, I use uh, I use Al uh, Lee uh, um, filters. I've got the whole uh, ND Grad and all the ND filters. Um, I'm finding that I'm just recently, probably in the last year actually, I've gone away from using uh, ND Grads and just shooting uh, multiple exposures and just blending them uh, after the fact. Um, but with panos, uh, trying to steer away from them uh, uh, these days as well. But if I'm using, uh, uh, if I'm shooting panos, I'll tend to just still use the ND grads. Just that I find that it's a little bit too much uh, time uh, after the fact in trying to uh, take. Uh, let's say if you're shooting a six-image uh, stitch, and if you're going to be doing multiple exposures, well then that turns into twelve uh, images. And I find if you're shooting around the times of sunrise, sunset, the light's changing very, very quickly. And so I just find that uh, trying to get it right after the fact is quite hard. So 
I just, uh, for that reason, I tend to use just ND grads when I'm shooting panos. Um, yeah, look, uh, I'm trying to uh, uh, change my ways, and I'm looking at uh, shooting more inland and uh, some of the mountain peaks around uh, around uh, Tasmania and New Zealand in the future. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, that all really. And talking about those remotes, I've got the same remote as you, Lee, and I go through two of them a year, and they're two hundred and seventy dollars each time. Either I wow. drop it in the water, or uh, usually they get waterlogged, and I have to uh, try and buy another one. So you're going to obviously try and muscle in on some of Car Kit's business there in Melbourne? Uh, <laughs> no, no. Well, he's never in Melbourne, as he said. So he's always in Europe or New Zealand. He's everywhere else but Melbourne. I don't, I don't. Very rare that you see uh, images uh, from Victoria recently from him. So uh, yeah. Um, no, look, I like to get around as well. I'm based in Melbourne, but gee, I, uh, you know, I like to think that I'll. Uh, I'll be shooting a lot of Tasmania, actually. That's where my interest is, and also just the, a lot of the Alpine region of Victoria. Um, yeah, uh, cool. that's about it. All righty. Well, um, don't give too much away. I won't have any questions to ask you. <laughs> so, um, all right, let's go for some questions then. Um, let's go to Dylan. Seeing as you're on the left, you can go first. Um, uh, sorry, sorry. Dylan and Dylan Mary um, and that's basically what I want to talk to you about is uh, the fact that you're a sort of a dynamic duo and um, you know it could be a dream shooting with your your wife or it could be like a worst nightmare seems like you don't have much of a choice um, so I, I really want to just uh, look in on that what's you know what's the sort of um, Disadvantages or advantages of shooting as a team? Well, I guess um, when we first started, we obviously only bought one camera, and um, the disadvantage there clearly was that one person was standing around, you know, watching the light happen while the other person was grabbing their shot. And so um, when we discovered that we both really wanted to shoot at the same time, we eventually bought a second camera. Um, the disadvantage, um, most the most obvious one would be that you need a double set of everything. Um, you need two cameras, you need two tripods, you need two sets of filters, but um, I suppose you, can, you get to share the moment, um, you know, with your best friend. Um, that's one of the biggest advantages. We get to go out together and nobody's going, oh, come on, hurry up, I want to go home or whatever. We're both enjoying the moment. Um, yeah. And it's a lot of good fun. Like We can go, oh, did you get that shot? Or, oh, did you see this or anything? You know, that kind of thing. It's just the sharing of it makes it, yeah. um, you know, really, really enjoyable. So who had the so interest in interest? I have to admit it started with me and it was basically a lot of internet work and it was just it was basically theory crafting. I would just hang out on forums and <laughs> troll them and stuff like that. And I wouldn't wouldn't go out and shoot anything because I had no practical experience, but I did all of this research and I sort of knew everything theoretically, um, but n not in the field. Um, and I think it really started in South America. Yeah, in South America in 2007 on our honeymoon when we still had the one camera. Um, Dylan sort of started to get into it a little bit more when you know he was looking at the landscapes around him. And I think at this point, particular point in time, Dylan would be the better photographer right now. No, I just shoot more. <laughs> Well, it's good. I mean, we're, I mean, we're, 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 we're sort of photos coming, from, coming from, from at different times. Um, I, I, I don't know if I see them as from one photographer. I kind of just see them as uh, ever looking, and it's a very similar style throughout uh, all the images. I think that that might be down to uh, maybe the way you've learned it or uh, post processing. But it's um, you know, it's also nice um, if you know if you need a second photographer for a wedding or anything like that. It's just like. Um, you know, you've got someone to rely on. I'm sure it's a bit, a uh, bit more difficult now. You've got um, Charlotte, is it? Yeah. Um, so um, I, yeah. so I find, um, you know, going out and shooting or traveling um, with with a newborn, and I must say that photo of uh, of Dylan with 
baby on back, sat in a, or, or stood in a river, it's just uh, cracked me up. I, so, I, sh I showed my uh, fiance it, actually, it was very funny. Yes, well, um, I admit to uh, being a little bit scared sometimes when Dylan does that, taking a, taking a baby out. But um, look, we, we obviously um, have her safety in mind as the top priority. So, you know, we don't go out and try and get those crazy shots at a unique angle or anything like that, like we used to do when it would just be us that we would have to worry about. Um, clearly, in the beginning, it was much more difficult. Um, you know, she couldn't sit up straight in the carrier, or, or you know, hold her head up, and or she would need more naps and things like that. But she's now 15 months, and it's a lot um, easier to take her out, and it helps that she likes being in the carrier and moving around. Um, so usually, what happens is. Um, one of us will carry her, usually Dylan, and um, I'll be free to uh, do my thing while Dylan sort of just, you know, stays relatively safe on on solid ground most of the time. Um, but, you know, in the mornings I'll, I might stay in because I'm not a particularly morning person. So Dylan might head out for his dawn shoot and I'll stay home. Um, with her, and so that's how it works um, at the moment, and I think it's it's going quite well. It sounds uh, pretty, uh, pretty ideal. ideal. I wish someone would get out for sunrises for me. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and um, do you uh, have any like sort of capture or any uh, techniques or anything you want to discuss uh, or share with the the hangout? Um, that again? That again? <laughs> That's right. Just uh, swapping over the headphone, but um, I think uh, we we try and get everything um, as right as it can be in the camera on the field at the one time. Um, whether that involves using GNDs or bracketing exposures or, or doing a bit of both, um, just to get the exposure right. Um, that's one thing we focus on. But usually, um, say for a sunset or for a, um, a dawn shoot, um, I'll often be there like way in advance in the dark and try to find a composition that I like and uh, stick to it. Um, and um, once the composition is set, then I can worry about uh, all the other kind of um, uh, technical details. Now, I guess sometimes it happens when you set up for one composition, then, oh my god, all of a sudden the light's better somewhere else and then you've got to run off. But um, on the whole, um, I try and stick to the preferred composition because you really can't fix that in uh, post-process, whereas um, the exposures, if you take uh, quite a few of those or use the right combination of GNDs, you can possibly salvage some shots. So that, that's uh, the main approach. And um, uh, I like to go back to the same spot over and over and over again. Uh, you might have seen lots of Port Malunga shots from me because it's one of my favorite locations. But yeah. I still haven't got the shot that I actually want from there because the light's never been quite right. So. Um, I will be going there, back there lots and lots and lots again. Um, so, unfortunately so for our... Um, from you? From you? How far away is that from you? Uh, it's about um, 45 minutes drive uh, from where we live. Uh, so it's... Uh, I'm a very early waker anyway, so um, I'm usually up at 5, and so I take a drive down there. In winters it's particularly good because the ones are later. Yeah, I, I think it's um, important. Yeah, to the, the takeaway from that um, would be to concentrate on maybe two or three uh, uh, compositions in any one location, and uh, don't rush around trying to shoot everything. Is uh, you know sort of the main thing. Um, and also, I think it's important to sort of own your local area or or own an area. You know, to really um, to shoot it and shoot it and shoot it until you've got those shots or, or you've got the best shots that are out there. Um, so what what does um, next year? Uh, what can we expect from you guys? Uh, any change in the way you you're doing your business or genres you're going to shoot? Uh, well, we've um, our last kind of official wedding that we're shooting is in um, uh, late March next year, and we're not planning on shooting um, any more weddings um, simply because with uh, Charlotte around and takes the post process while it's just uh, not a very um, viable thing during the week. We, we still love um, the actual process of shooting the wedding, but it's just post process work after that becomes a real slog after a while. 
Um, we might, however, um, try to get into a little bit of pet photography because we're animal lovers, and um, uh, in particular, um, you know, uh, dogs. And so, uh, if we can get a bit into that as well, that'd be enjoyable. When the kind of post-processing afterward is not as intensive as a wedding, where you're producing hundreds and hundreds of shots. Um, but we really want to focus our um, direction on landscape photography uh, from next year onward, if possible. Um, we've been meaning to try and uh, start doing workshops both in the field and post-process, but you know, time constraints of work have kind of prevented anything from happening except for one small trial workshop. Um, that, but that might be something that's on the horizon. Um, in terms of, uh, in terms of um, trips planned for next year, um, hopefully we'll be able to get back to New Zealand for another three weeks in South Island um, to finish the North Coast and the West Coast, which we didn't even get to last time. Um, and uh, we've also got a, um, a conference that we're speaking at in uh, Meriden in WA uh, for the WA Photographic Foundation in August of next year. So that might give us a chance just to visit the southwest of WA and have a look around there. Um, and then in October, um, I happen to have a, or I should say I discovered a work-related conference in Seattle. Uh, which is conveniently placed in the Pacific Northwest. So we might try and kill two birds with one stone and go on a work conference there and then visit some of the um, places that um, people like Darren White and Chip yeah. Phillips and all that have been shooting and work that we've been drooling on wanting to see. So um, that's probably all we've got planned for 2013. I, I think that's uh, 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 Sounds. Uh, yeah, we we'll keep this busy. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds exciting. I uh, look forward to seeing those images. Yeah, look forward to being there. Cool. Um, all right, Jerome. So, um, you like looking through all your photos and that you seem to have travelled uh, basically. You know, the, the top ten photography locations in the world um, would be sort of uh, where is it? Uh, just out of um, Las Vegas in America, um, all the national parks there, Death Valley, etc. Uh, Iceland, um, I don't know where else. Um, off the top of my head, what? Uh, so, where where do you plan to shoot, or is there anything you feel like you're missing as far as those those um, locations? Well, look, there's a lot of places I still like to go to. Obviously, I think um, most photographers have some sort of dream list. Um, and on mine, uh, Patagonia is probably very high up. Um, yeah. Obviously, one of the popular destinations with Iceland, um, Namibia as well in Africa. You know, those are the obvious that have been quite shot in the last few years. Um, I would actually love to go back to Iceland. Um, I absolutely love the place. Um, I, I've been obsessed with it since I've been there in July. Um, I was very much looking forward to the trip and. Um, we had some very, very difficult weather when we were there. So I was there for 15 days, and it basically rained for 12 out of the 15 days. It was a pretty wet trip. But um, this, despite that, it was in quite quickly, and I, I thought the place was completely amazing. Um, obviously, I, so I went to the southwest of the US, and that is usually one of the top destinations for most photographers. and. Obviously, very different landscapes from what you would see in Iceland, but um, the, the main difference for me was that the southwest, most of the images were, had been seen before, and as well, I find the landscape quite static. Um, well, what I was amazed with in Iceland is that you really feel like you, you're on a, something that is living. You know, you've got, like, gas coming out, massive waterfalls. It's, it's, it's a, a very dynamic environment, and the, the weather changed constantly. So probably back to Iceland. Um, around the northern uh, northern Europe, uh, I'd probably like to go to Norway as well. I think that would be a great destination. And, and for both, I'd like to go back uh, probably in winter because I didn't have the, the chance to shoot the northern light because I went to Iceland in the middle of the summer. And then obviously you've got um, locations like Antarctica. I mean, that would be great to go there. Um, Antarctica is a massive commitment both in terms of time and um, in terms of uh, budget. Yeah, so I've got quite a few friends and obviously quite a few friends photographers who are um, organizing workshops going down there and I think you can't really talk about workshops actually, it's more expeditions and often you go down there with scientists and cinematographs and, and so on. 
So that that would be on the list as well. Just need to try to find the the, the time to do it. Um, and then the, the funny thing is, um, I've actually never um, had the chance to photograph my own country. So I've actually uh, I've never taken photos around Australia. France because I've I've started um, after I moved to Australia, and every time I go back to France, it's, it's the family and friends and. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of, um, several parts of friends that I would love to shoot. Um, actually, somehow I'm a kind of jealous of Khaki because he yeah, actually got to shoot some of the places where I grew up um, in Brittany and uh, around the west of France. And, and I would really love to photograph those places. And then maybe Turkey, Croatia, um, all the, the eastern Mediterranean zone, that would be actually you know, really great to get there. And, Is there uh, anything you've left out? Any countries that you uh, maybe I should have asked you which countries you didn't want to go to? Yeah, I think <laughs> you can see my uh, my enthusiasm. But I, you can actually flip that question to the other guys because I'd be interested uh, to know to know what are the the countries that they would really want to shoot in the, the next year or two. Yeah, um, Dylan, uh, anything or or Everlook? Do you guys uh, anything you want to shoot immediately or next year? So New Zealand. Um, I think um, I'm really looking forward to doing some of the um, hikes uh, into the Alpine lakes. Um, so for Marianne kindly grants me a few nights away uh, when we're traveling. So um, like for instance, uh, I shot um, Lake Mackenzie last year on the Rupert track on an overnight trip. So uh, I might do some hiking around there, some lakes. And get some, uh, if I'm very lucky, I might get similar conditions up there. Um, I'd really love to shoot some of the glaciers around Fox Glacier, Franz Joseph down there as well. Um, and uh, I didn't get a chance to visit the West Coast. We didn't get a chance to visit the West Coast at all while we were there, so it'd be just good to get some uh, seascapes from New Zealand as well. Um, but um, as, uh, Jerome, as Jerome mentioned, um, I, we were amazed with Iceland. We've already been there twice for a total of eight weeks, and um, we would absolutely would love to go back there if the opportunity arose. So uh, yeah, I, I think uh, with everything Jerome has said, <laughs> That shot of car kits with the uh, the seaweed and the mountains in the background, I think we can all agree that's an amazing shot. Um, a place we'd all want to check out, I'm sure. Yeah, Curio Bay is uh, is pretty incredible. Like that that seaweed really looks as though it's alive. Um, yeah. And uh, as an added bonus, after dark when we finish shooting the landscapes, all the um, hoiho or the yellow eye penguins start hopping around. So it's a fantastic location for all sorts of reasons down south of New Zealand as well. I mean, the so whole country is really good because it's, um, well. it's quite compact. Yeah, just being so close to Australia is um, definitely it's got to be on every photographer's uh, wish list. Um, Kaku, what, uh, anything you would like to shoot immediately? Uh, yeah, I've got my wish list. Uh, probably Lofoten Islands would be at the top of it. Where is that? Uh, Norway. Ah, uh, cool. Uh, Why is I, that? I like to go where everyone's not going, I reckon. Yeah. So, Antarctica has, was on my list, but um, then it became very popular, and then I think with the GFC, no one yeah. went to Antarctica anymore, so I'm particularly interested in, in that. Um, at the moment, I'm very interested in France, so uh, when I and I'm committed to um, shooting Carnival pretty much every year at the moment. So I'll go shoot um, Carnival and then probably look at the Dolomiti in Italy. Cool. And uh, and then and then France has got all sorts of um, interesting islands that uh, I'd like to explore. Okay, um, I'll I'll come back to you about um, some of those locations just in a minute. Um, anything for yourself, Ricardo? Oh, look, I've only ever shot in Australia. I've been overseas uh, plenty of times, but never was never into uh, photography when I did. And um, look, I've plenty of places. South America is high on my list. Uh, uh, so is North America. So they're probably the next two. Um, but uh, yeah, look, looking forward to getting to New Zealand next year, and uh, that'll be the first time. But uh, there's some incredible places in France. I agree uh, with the others and uh, Chamonix. So uh, that's incredible uh, from the images I've seen. And uh, and uh, yeah, look, pr pretty much those places. Uh, yeah, there's plenty of uh, amazing places, that's for sure. Looking to yeah. spread the wings from now on, that's for sure. Yeah, it's um, definitely you know a case of budget a lot of the time. Um, myself, I uh, 
like talking about I, w I wanted to find a place that hadn't been shot to death and uh, like Harkit said and um, the one location that I, I really wanted to go and see once I've, um, you know, I saw it on uh, some nature programs on the BBC was uh, Pakistan but um, the glaciers there are just unbelievable. Um, obviously it's not the easiest place to get to and uh, it'll cost a lot. So um, I think the next the next few on the list would be um, would be Namibia, um, but again that's been shot reasonably well, but amazing country. Um, and then if if I really don't have the budget, then uh, it'll be back to New Zealand or Tassie or or the Blue Mountains. Who knows? <laughs> so, um, Jerome, um, I'll just ask you some more questions. Um, so, where was your your favourite location you've shot? over uh, all these different places? Um, look, obviously it's maybe of the the, uh, the places I've seen in Iceland, obviously, but um, um, in Australia, one of the places I really, really liked was um, Cape Wulamai in Victoria. Yeah. Um, very impressed with Tasmania as well, I mean, just to talk about the local um, jewels. Yeah. And I uh, didn't get a chance to shoot up north, so I would be looking for that. Yeah, I think I think one of my favorite spots would be Cape Wormai. I really like it. I don't, I don't know why. It's just there's uh, something special about that place. Um, and then we've got a lot of um, now very famous um, um, parts of the coast around Sydney, such as Turimeta, which have been shot millions of times, and it's still quite special to do that. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned that you wanted to go back to Iceland in winter. Is it um, still accessible? As far as uh, the, you know, I, I believe some of the middles cut off during the winter. Is that right? Yeah, I think I, I wouldn't go in full winter. I mean, you would you would go uh, just before or just after. Like Iceland is kind of round, and basically the, the, the middle is entirely covered with ice and yeah. snow during the, um, the during the winter. So you can't actually get in. So for people who actually want to visit these countries, it's probably good to start with a trip in summer where you can pretty much go everywhere and then have some sort of tailored trip um, at, during the appropriate season for the Northern Lights. Mm. Um, but yeah, we, I would definitely like to go back there. Cool. Um, so you, uh, having spoken to you a few times, you're a lot about perfecting the art of photography rather than necessarily well, obviously you've got the technical side down, but um, I know your girlfriend gives you a hard time about getting the art right and not having just another postcard shot. Uh, she's obviously in the background there. Sorry, hello. Yeah, she, you've just made a friend. It's good to, uh, I mean, it's good to push uh, push the art form, and uh, I think that's a good thing. Um, so uh, even, you know, trying some experimental things as well uh, with your sort of drawing photo thing I saw on your Facebook. Um, do you want to share any insight or any learnings uh, around sort of being more about art rather than uh, postcards or anything like that? Well, um, I, you know, obviously I wouldn't define my uh, my photography as art photography because uh, what I do truly is landscape, and a lot of the landscape that I shoot are are well known. Now, you know, you spoke about this um, image that I posted recently, which was kind of half photography, half drawing. And that wasn't really a project of mine. It was just having a bit of fun with my uh, mom because my mom is actually a, a painter. And so, you know, since I've been very, very young, I've seen her working in um, um, in her studio and, you know, going through phases and so on. And it was very interesting. Now I'm thinking about it retrospectively. I actually don't get to see her that much because she's in a different country. But, um, but I remember how much work she would put into finding some sort of new concept, you know, into into uh, really creating something that is original and I think the difficulty and especially with you know somehow our generation of digital photographers is that you use the web to um, show your work and people tend to reproduce the same thing it is becoming harder to kind of get out of the the mold and you know what, what I could see in between uh, um, the difference in between what my mom used to do and what I am doing is that she used to work a lot more around the concept, so she used to have a good heart to think about what she wanted to achieve and, and, and really experimenting things while I tend to go for places that are nice and then I basically put my camera on the tripod, you know, put a few filters and then in the post-processing phase, we're both in, in terms of composition and in the post-processing phase trying to come up with something a bit more original than the usual postcard. 
Um, but, but one of the things that I would have on my to-do list would be to actually have a good thing about how to landscape photography differently. And that will probably come through um, looking at um, other artists, so probably even outside of photography, so painters or designers, and trying to get a bit of a different idea on the kind of image that we produce. Yeah, it's interesting because uh, with obviously with photography, you choose what you want to exclude from an image uh, by composition, um, whereas painting, you choose what to include in the image. So um, really, you know, it's a case of building up a, a scene. But landscapes, we're not always necessarily, uh, you know, we can't. We're there, and we're uh, we're given what we, uh, you know, what nature has for us. So. Um, it must be hard to draw inspiration from art and then take that into landscapes, but um, but you know it's it's great that you're striving for it, and uh, I definitely think as 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 you learn the uh, technicalities of photography and you just uh, you know you learn to forget them and then you can concentrate on the art form. Um, and uh, what what have you got planned for next year? Anything? 2013. Well, at this stage, not well defined. Um, I'm probably going to go either to Papua New Guinea or to Indonesia. Um, I actually have um, my parents traveling around the world, and we, we they've been doing that for several years now, so we try to join them on their trip. Um, so I've, I've shot a lot of islands around Australia. The only difficulty with that is, uh, well, you're on water. So it's not easy to use a tripod or anything else. It's a different type of photography, but Papua New Guinea could be interesting. And as I'll probably go back to Europe, and finally I might try to allocate you know, a few days to be able to shoot at least two or three places in France. I think uh, it will take my passport back if I don't do it. <laughs> well, I mean, you haven't lost that outrageous accent, so that's good. <laughs> I'm sure they'll let you in. <laughs> I'm sure they will. Cool, thanks very much. Um, okay, so Kake, let's uh, move on to you. You. Um, so you so you said you're actually shooting the carnival every every year now. Is that um, you know what what drew you to that in the first place, and uh, and and where where do you see it going from here? Yeah. Um, the first time I went to Venice was 2005, and to be honest, I wasn't all that impressed. It was like, you know, very touristy, and uh, I, I didn't think I'd be back. But um, a couple of years later, I was looking through some brochures for uh, workshops, and uh, I came across this thing about Carnival. I thought, oh, okay, check it out. And uh, so that was in 2008. I uh, 2007, 2008. Um, I actually had a I had a commission with um, Canon to shoot some stuff with the with the newly released uh, 1DS3. Then, so that was cool because I think I was the only photographer with the 1DS3 at the time. Um, so I so I think just approaching Venice, you know, with all the I, think I, I arrived in the evening and, and just watching um, all the all the facades of the of the buildings reflecting uh, in the golden light. And, and, then, and then just seeing these figures floating around in their costumes, that was quite bewitching. And uh, so I've returned three times since. So that, um, I mean, that keeps you interested? You're uh, obviously drawn drawn to it every year now? I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm drawn, drawn to it uh, every year. Um, it's actually very difficult to to photograph Carnival. To, to, I, I think, for me, it's the most challenging um, location to shoot. Uh, you, there are thousands of photographers every year, and trying to come up with um, something striking is, is challenging. And also, in terms of skills, like I'm drawing on a portrait, um, street, landscape. I just really, and, and uh, the way I use light, I'm just really drawing on every um, photography. That I can come up with. Ricardo, yeah. can you mute your mic, please? If, if you're typing, thanks. Sure. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Kaki. Um, so, so, I mean, uh, some of your shots are amazing as far as your, well, yeah, you're right, with the scales, you're, you're posing someone um, within a scene, and then you're also, as far as technical um, 
technicalities. You're shooting into the sun, and uh, yeah. and, and you're not flash filling that, or are you bouncing any? I'm not. I'm not flash filling it. Um, that, that that's what I mean by uh, sort of drawing on you know every sort of skill I have in, in that. Um, the, the, there's a photo that was backlit that uh, was featured on a um, on a portrait website. And no one could figure out you know, how it was done. They all thought it had to be some sort of fill light. And no, I just used a grad on, on top of the cost, you know, on top of the person's head. <laughs> and then uh, obviously brought brought out their face and the mask in uh, Photoshop and, uh, and and rescued it, but saved the highlights off the sunset. Is that correct? Yeah. So yeah. So you have to be very very careful with the exposures and also really. Oh observant about the light because um, you know there might be light sources that uh, that you're just not not aware of like just the slight um, amount of illumination from a lamp somewhere or reflected light from a building so I, I never use um, flash for the carnival uh, photos it's the you know very often when when the when the flash hits a mask it, it has a, a very de detrimental effect on it and um, on on the first uh, on the first uh, visit of of Carnival, it's, it's also very difficult. You've got you know thousands of um, photographers around, um, and you're not known to any of the masks. And it takes a while to, to sort of build up um, a relationship with uh, all the masks, so you can organise private shoots and the like. And I think I've got myself to that stage now, so. Um, very much looking towards uh, 2013 when I've got um, heaps of shoots. Well, I up. think you're obviously you've you um, well as far as I know you own that um, you know that festival and uh, you know I, th I think worldwide you probably are as well. Is that would you say that's a fair assumption or? Um, Look, I, I look. I'm proud of my carnival work, and you know obviously I, I wouldn't be able to. Uh, get you know the mask to do private shoots with me if um, they didn't think the work was up up to scratch. I guess. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, so you kind of um, you're a landscape photographer and you're also travel. Uh, which is the preference, or where where do you see yourself going? Um, I I prefer landscape photography. Um, <laughs> I actually find. Maybe because I find travel photography more difficult in that you were talking about how in landscape photography we often try and exclude stuff. Uh, with travel there's even much more junk that um, you'll be trying to exclude. And um, in landscape photography it's usually only landscape photographers who take the photos, those that are dedicated enough to wake up at 5am and, and hike out and, and shoot. Well, with the, with the travel stuff, um, you know, you know, every time Dick and Harry have got their camera and, and, and shooting all the popular locations, so it's you know, to me, I, I find it more difficult to come up with uh, something fresh. <laughs> it wasn't like one of those pop-up flashes that filled the uh, no, the photo. Okay. Um, no, you're right. I mean, flash photography. Well, it can kill images, that's for sure, unless it's used very well, um, especially with you know different uh, color temperatures and things like that. Um, so you you've been concentrating a lot on Europe. Um, so your latest series is from Paris. Um, where so you, you're going to go back to Paris this year? Is that correct? Yes, I will. I'll stop by in, in Paris. Uh, I got a lot. I like to shoot. Um, I like to have work from every arrondissement. I haven't got that yet, so I, I think I'll probably be happy if I've got another 50 to 100 uh, sort of quality shots that I can put on my my website. So are these um, self-funded, um, if you don't mind me asking, self-funded projects? or As the street stuff is, yeah. um, <laughs> the fashion stuff is not, is, is, um, is com uh, commission, uh, commissioned. Um, and you said you went full time. Um, well, you've been pretty much full time this year. I believe you're a doctor before that. Is that correct? Or yes, yes. 
That's right. So um, how did you find the transition? Was it an easy one to make? Oh, look, I think it's really... I think it's really difficult for you know, someone to go straight into photography that, you know, they need... Uh, I think these days you need to have the backing of another job to be able to make uh, that transition. Definitely. I think um, I think you're probably the only professional here or well, um, full-timer. Um, who, who knows what the definition of professional is? Uh, I guess, you know, we're all calling ourselves professionals, but um, in reality, you know, you need that, that other source of income to support photography, especially the landscape stuff. It's just um, it's difficult to make a living from. I think yeah, it, it's very. It, I see a lot of people um, selling themselves short, and if if people had a you know a second job to fall on, um, they wouldn't be you know, giving stuff away for free or undercharging. Yeah. So I, I'm. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy that you know I've always had uh, you know the second backup job that you know if, even if, if I do it you know for a month or two that you know I'm not never tempted to um, give stuff away for free or you know too cheaply. I, it, it ruins the whole industry if people do that. Um, they're you know I mean it's just uh, devaluing the art form. Um, and even if you do give stuff away for free, you you know you have your own expenses, you have insurance, you have your camera gear. You want to upgrade. You have to travel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And um, a lot of people, I think, um, you know, sometimes obviously credit uh, on a photo is is enough, but um, it really people should be paying you for your talents. I think. And um, I, I think so. And yeah. I, I can't really see you know too many instances where um, giving stuff away for free would really benefit you in terms of exposure and, and uh, you know money down the track. Yeah, um, op I'll open that to the other guys. Do you think? Uh, do you have you given stuff away for free, or what's your standing on it these days, uh, Dylan? Uh, we've been very guilty of that, actually. Uh, in fact, um, when we first started doing weddings, there were a whole lot of uh, relatives who started asking us to just uh, bring the camera along and things like that. So we ended up shooting a lot of um, uh, weddings unwittingly for free. Um, I think part of the reason was we were very naive about it at the time. We weren't actually looking to make it a business. And so because we love shooting, we basically just did a lot of favors for a lot of people without me. Um, that we were coming into the detriment of uh, ourselves and the industry, I suppose. Yeah. So we're kind of veering away a little bit from that now and trying to set um, you know, a proper value on the work that we have or that we perceive we have. So yeah. that's kind of um, how we're feeling about it now. We're kind of making a transition towards um, you know, the excitement of uh, getting people to like you because you're giving stuff away for free versus getting people to like you because you produce good work. That's right, that's yeah. Right, yeah. Cool, and there's cool. your room. Uh, yeah, no, look, I, I fully agree with what um, Kaki said, I think. You have to try to avoid it. Um, when I when I studied all the the workshops and so on, I think um, my pricing was probably quite low. And um, you know, through my day job, um, I thought I had a good business acumen. But because I had this other job, I, I didn't feel that I should really look into pricing things properly. And a friend of mine said, "Oh yeah, that that's good." So um, how many people say no when you tell them what the price is? And and I said, "Well, no one." No one ever says no. So he said to me, "Well, that's because your price is wrong. If if no one comes back and say no, that means that you're probably far away from the the limit." And I thought that was kind of an interesting argument. Um, and so yeah, progressively with more experience and you know having run this several times um, in Australia and then uh, back in Europe, I readjusted things. So I guess when you've got the the, the other work on the side, you you kind of let a few things go that you shouldn't if you were full-time. Because as soon as you do that, basically you compromise you know, kind of your, your work. I think it's also a confidence thing, isn't it? it really, if you, um, you're confident enough to say, this is what I cost and, um, and you pay, or I don't need your business. Um, and obviously, if you're struggling you know, to make money and to survive, then uh, you know, you, there might be some negotiation there. Um, but if you if you can afford to say no to things, then um, 
it's a great position to be in, and uh, I, I think it's worth you know knowing what your business costs you without doing anything, um, and and with all the overheads and things like that that I have, um, you know, you're looking at, uh, I think the sort of base rate for any photographer should be at least $100 an hour. Um, you know, some of the commercial guys are a grand and a half, uh, you know, a thousand plus a day, or, or a thousand for a half day even. Um, so when you put it in, uh, in perspective of, of what those guys are running, you know, I think uh, you shouldn't be dividing. Well, uh, I think it, it depends as well of what, what you want to do. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of semi-professional people who want to go professional. And yeah. uh, you, like you, you can't go half with this. You've got to go you know, all in, um, in my opinion. Uh, because me, personally, I'm not too sure I will give up my day work in the, the short or mid-term. Then it's hard to put yourself into, well, work again in, in the photography side of things. Because I've studied that as something that you know kind of helped me to escape from my work, um, and now that I'm, you know I'm interested as well in, in building a business around it, but you need to find a balance. So it, it depends how much time you spend on your day work and what you can do with it. But um, yeah, I agree with your comments. I think once you've decided that you want to do that seriously, price yourself seriously, and be a professional, as the title indicates it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ricardo, do you have any, um, are you giving away stuff or uh, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, I agree with the other guys, it devalues the industry and uh, I mean it's okay for, it's not It's not okay for anyone really, I mean uh, we're all part time uh, and full time uh, kids full time but if us giving away work for free, it's uh, really harming the industry and really harming those who are uh, full-time and professional photographers out in the, in the industry and we're really not doing them any favours at all. Uh, it's like what's happened to the wedding industry with people uh, uh, giving uh, all the images away on a disc with no, no charge, uh, you know, that's all your, all your um, you know, uncles and part-time, you know, single mums are part-time workers and it's really ruining the industry for other professional uh, wedding photographers. So I think we all, uh, part-time hobbyists, we all uh, have, uh, I guess, an obligation to the industry to try and protect it uh, for the others that uh, try and make a livelihood from it. And in doing so, we try and in we increase our chances of doing so as well. Because if everyone starts giving uh, things away for free, well, you know, what hope do we have to try and start charging things? Uh, Jerome mentioned that he was charging a bit too cheap for his workshops. I mean, you know, things like um, scoop on and all that that are fifty dollar photography classes for two hours. Those things just absolutely ruin in the industry, and people just have a perception that that they expect things for next to nothing and everything should be really cheap and uh, as you mentioned Lee, we all have so many expenses, uh, I mean, you know, for example insurance, I pay $600 a, a year, it's more than my car and uh, but also every time you travel it's uh, thousands of dollars, uh, equipment uh, and you know, traveling is <laughs> very expensive, I've certainly spent a lot of money on petrol and uh, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars so we need to uh, try and uh, owe it to ourselves to try and get some of that back and um, yeah, so I agree with everyone's uh, thoughts but having said that, uh, look, in the past, not so much now but I've, uh, I guess, for close friends, I've um, given uh, close friends prints at cost price, for very close friends but you know, I'm trying to like, try and put a stop to that as well now and uh, certainly with workshops, not, nothing's ever been done for free and uh, I've always uh, charged at I think a reasonable rate but um, yeah. That's yeah, I sense. think as far as those uh, coupon websites, I think people soon learn. Um, well, as far as I've heard, anyway, that you know you pay forty, fifty dollars for a photography course, and you're going to be there with you know fifty, a hundred people. Um, so there's no one-on-one -on -one sort of attention. Whereas the people, uh, the likes of ourselves, that charge you know a few hundred dollars for a, a workshop, um, you know you get that that one-on-one -on -one time, and you really get more value out of it, I think. Um, it's, it's certainly my customers have found that anyway. So, um, back to Kakit, just um, do you have any any tips or anything you'd like to talk to us about? Maybe um, any newbie, uh, you know, new people to the, the photography industry, any traps or any capture um, tips? Hmm. <laughs> I've got, uh, I've got plenty, but, um, yeah. I thought you were going to say you had none. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, oh, come on. <laughs> oh, where do I start? Um, Give us, you know, what, you don't need to go through all of them, uh, just maybe one or two nuggets. Yeah. Um, I, look, I, maybe, maybe I just get bored easily, but um, I really do try to maximize. Uh, I, I, I guess the way I operate is maybe the opposite of, of, of Dylan is that I, I don't like coming back to the same place over and over again. It's that I just get I just get bored after you know two or three times, and you know I want to visit something else. So um, you know often the way I approach it is that you know this might be the only time I'm I'm, I'm visiting this location. So uh, I really want to. Um, make the most of the light, get the best composition uh, I possibly can. Um, and so, you know, if, I think photography is, in, in many cases, a, an art form of inches. Um, you know, nothing, I, I don't think that anything should be an accident that, uh, you know, it shouldn't be an accident that your tripod's set up. You know, at four foot, or you know, four foot and, and three inches, or or angled, you know, twenty five degrees to the right. It should all, you know, I think be you know a, a very calculated, um, strategic uh, uh, sort of process that um, you know things don't just magically um, happen by themselves. Photos don't take themselves. So uh, I think attention to detail is what um, makes the difference between. Um, you know, a good shot and a great shot. Mm, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, you know, just with lowering and, uh, you know, extending your tripod, you change the perspective of the scene and, uh, you know, compress the mid-ground or expand it out and, uh, and you know, you can have elements sitting differently within the scene by just, you know, changing your tripod with a few inches, so. Yeah. Actually, that uh, I, I'm really big on perspective control. Um, so you know, using your tripod um, height to uh, sort of minimize or maximize certain elements. Yeah. You know, whether you want to, you know, if you've got a lot of rubbish in the mid mid ground, you want to um, get rid of that by changing changing your the height of the tripod, or it's um, or, or the yeah. opposite if, if there's something really interesting there. And and the same thing with your uh, distance from from the subject. You know, whether um, it's, it's strong enough for you to do the classic new fast of the composition. So yeah, oh, big uh, perspective control. What was it? Perspective control. I'll, uh, perspective I'll control. I'll, <laughs> I've, I've got a I've got a blog article in the pipeline, uh, you know, with the with a list of uh, sort of compositional elements that I think is important. Cool. Look forward to that. Um, all right. So go to Ricardo. Um, you recently posted on your uh, website or Facebook that you're sort of changing direction as far as capture. Uh, what what do you mean by that? What what exactly are you changing? Uh, what's your mindset behind that? Oh, look, I just find uh, I've just come to a point where I don't know. Uh, I've lost my way, and uh, I'm finding that I don't really have a voice. Uh, I guess a photography voice, uh, I guess my unique mark. Um, I look at people's images and uh, without even um, knowing who took it, I can tell you who took it just by looking at the image. I, I Basically, uh, they're very unique to a particular style and I find that I don't have that. Uh, I mean, that's my opinion anyway. And it seems that my images uh, tend to change depending on uh, which photographer's work I'm uh, drawing inspiration from. So I guess uh, recently I've just had a, a bit of a think and about you know the direction I should be going in and really uh, I really want to be going down a direction that's more true to myself rather than trying to create images that uh, people are most likely to buy and I think it's really important uh, that uh, you shoot images uh, that are that are unique to you and uh, images that make you happy. So having said that. Uh, something that I'm personally obsessed with is um, just witnessing the interaction of light on uh, subjects and uh, so I want to try and really simplify my images from now on and hence why I'm uh, really going to be shooting just with zoom lenses I can see. 
uh, and just trying to just reduce some of that mess and the junk and just really uh, simplify, um, simplify the scene and really I want to make it my focus to just try and capture light and uh, capturing light uh, is my focus and the second thing would be the subject so really just trying to capture that interaction of light on the subject so um, look I'm really uh, interested in getting out to the mountains and uh, getting up for dawn and seeing the first light um, hit the mountain peaks and uh, that's the sort of stuff I want to go down and uh, I know certainly that's what I'm really obsessed with and even with no camera I would just sit there and just uh, stand there in awe of the, of the light show that's happening and I really want to just try and capture that so that's what I meant uh, when I said that I'm just changing my ways a little bit and just really just simplifying my images from now on. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, first trip uh, is out to Mungo National Park where you've been Lee and a few others have gone. So I'll be going out there for about a week and uh, yeah, uh, basically um, ha having a bit of a play around and uh, yeah, going from there. It's interesting, uh, you mentioned you know doing your own style rather than photos that sell. Um, there's definitely, I think, you know, a time where it comes where you say, right, I'm either doing these postcard shots that will sell, um, you know, pictures of dolphins, uh, whatever, um, you know, that that type of shot um, that really sells, or you do the sort of moody landscapes that, um, and try and create your own style, uh, which is, I guess, what we've all we're all trying to do, um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, I think. Our client just basically changes, and we we look to um, interest other photographers and uh, photography magazines and things like that, rather than picture buyers. And uh, that's maybe why I don't sell any photos because I'm uh, just doing that. So, um, but you know what it's like, uh, I'm sure. Um, so, you how important um, is Photoshop in as far as you you making those images? Um, do you spend a lot of time? In, uh, in Photoshop? I think it's uh, extremely important. I guess uh, as everyone here attests to, a lot of people have a perception that Photoshop is somehow cheating, but to me they're just people who just don't understand. Uh, um, really taking a photograph with an iPhone without people knowing, there's a, a mini Photoshop, or there's a post-processing software built in the phone that's doing all that uh, processing for them without even knowing. So, look, uh, uh, our cameras are nowhere near as sophisticated as our eyesight and the dynamic range that our uh, eyes can record. So, I like to think that uh, Photoshop or any other software related is a, a, a tool that we can use that we can combine with our camera to try and recreate how we uh, remember the the scene. And uh, really, through Photoshop, we can really take images to where we. Um, where we want them and try and recreate the vision that we had of the scene and in doing that I think uh, it just is such a great outlet to, to exert your creativity on the image um, and uh, rather than capture the image I like to think that we, we all make images and uh, and certainly th that's my take on um, uh, Photoshop, it's definitely a two-step process and it's capturing the image and then obviously processing the image so uh, I think those two uh, are definitely required. Um, I mean, when, when you shoot JPEG, uh, you, you're at the mercy of the very, very limited processing c controls that uh, are built in the camera, really just limited to contrast, saturation, hue, and sharpness. Uh, I mean, what, why would you, why would you uh, allow an image just to be controlled by that very limited um, functionality when you, you've got uh, a, whole nother, a whole other world in Photoshop with uh, so many more manual, uh, more controls and flexibility, and really, uh, there's no limits on where you can take your image. So. Uh, uh, that I think it's uh, very, very important, and uh, yeah, whatever software you use, really. Um, uh, how much pr processing did I do? Look, uh, I like to think that I, I perhaps uh, each image, um, <laughs> because my computer's a bit slow, I, I'm finding that my, I'm taking between half an hour and an hour on each image. Wow. Um, uh, again, a lot of the, the times, perhaps waiting. I, I don't have a, the fastest computer, and uh, I mean, I'm not a, a per person who uh, works on images in bulk. And uh, you know, I'll pump out 50 images like a wedding photographer. I probably produce an image each every week 
or two weeks. Yeah. And so I can afford to wait that little bit longer rather than paying the, the $5,000 for a new computer. I prefer to put that, uh, invest that money into new travel, uh, traveling and uh, whatnot. Um, I'm very minimalistic like that. I don't have the best tools and whatnot. Uh, I think you can create some amazing results with uh, the basic of tools. And I find the workshops that I teach, I, t I teach people with uh, all the one, you know, a lot of people with all the you know, D4s, 1DXs, and even medium format, and uh, and their images aren't that strong. And so uh, the old saying goes, I could buy the same golf clubs that Tiger Woods uses. Doesn't mean I'm going to be hitting golf balls like Tiger Woods. So uh, really, with the base, most basic kits, you can achieve some really uh, powerful images. And um, yeah. I hope you're not using these um, internet cafe uh, computers wherever you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you just caught me out. I'm just traveling at the moment in Brisbane, and uh, I uh, my laptop's uh, uh, camera's not working. So rather than <laughs> rather than going out and buying one, I was a bit stingy, and I thought I'd come out to the local uh, internet cafe and uh, go from here. <laughs> cool. Um, I'll come back to you in a second. I'll, I'll ask you about uh, just some tips, but I'll just throw that out to the other guys. And um, so Dylan, how long do you take processing? Uh, Everlook, uh, how long do you take? Do you take processing? It depends on the picture. If um, if there's a lot of exposure blending, it could take us up to an hour. If it's a pano, it could take for an hour as well. And especially if it's a bracketed pano, that just takes forever. Um, but um, you know, when we're doing wedding images, uh, we clearly can't afford to spend anywhere near that amount of time for each image. We're producing, producing several hundred, um, so we um, we try to make things simple uh, as much as possible with one touch processing, with a action that does most of the things that we do for most pictures, and then from there make adjustments as we need to. But that's something I shy completely away from from the landscape images because. Um, you're not kind of mass producing images for a client as such. Um, we're in a stage where we're kind of producing images for ourselves and then uh, if people happen to like them that's an additional bonus and if we happen to actually be able to sell them that's an even bigger bonus. So um, we can afford to spend uh, longer on each image but um, overall um, I think um, the more you do um, the more you can conceptualize what you want to do at the start so that simplifies things a lot. Um, you know, I, I kind of have an idea what I want to, uh, where I want to go with post-processing with an image towards an end uh, result. And so, if you're just kind of blindly going and trying different things, then you may take a very, very long time. But uh, I think um, now, with lots of practice, uh, knowing the end, knowing roughly what the end result is, really helps as well. Yeah, I think that yeah, comes. I think that comes um, just being able to say, right, I know what I want to do with this image before you take it into the um, Jerome, how long do you usually take? Uh, very variable. Some images very quick, um, probably less than half an hour for some of the landscape photographs. And then um, I've got images I can spend a day. Uh, like just to, to give you an example, I think the, the images from Iceland, a few of them I've produced them in an hour or so. And then but the vast majority of them I would have worked an hour, two hours, and then left them. There. I would have come back to it a day or two days after, or sometimes a week after, um, and doing a few things. And what, what I tend to do as well, and uh, you're probably aware of this, <laughs> I've got a few friends I actually send my photos to when I'm in the process of, of kind of creating the images that I, I want to get. And I've done that with some of my shots from Iceland. I've actually sent a few of them to you. Um, and to, just to get an idea, sometimes you can work you know, one hour or two hours on email. You don't really know anymore if this is good or, or where you want to go, so you just have to shut down the file and then. <laughs> These things has been a great benefit for me anyway, um, just to send some images to you and just to say, you know, get, um, it's always good to have a fresh set of eyes on it. And uh, even if you go away from your computer for half an hour, you come back and it's like, what was I thinking with that image? But, um, Kaki, what about yourself? Uh, I'm probably a very fast processor, so 5 to 15 minutes in most shots. Um, I'll process, my well, aim is to get to one shot a day that's you know, fit for website gallery. Wow. And I'll usually process um, from each, each day of travel uh, two or three. Um, and then on the way back uh, on the plane, 
of the process and by the time I hit Australia I've usually you know, processed 80 90 percent of, of the shots um, I don't use a lot of I don't use a lot of um, processing tools like um, you know, it's just raw conversion double triple processing um, lots of levels adjustment uh, so the, the tools I use aren't complicated but uh, they, they are powerful and uh, I know how to fine-tune them and uh, I, I see the uh, whole process from you know, pre visualization to exposure to the end product as one continuum and that um, you know, you know the end product the, the, what what I what I envisage, uh, what I pre-visualize the uh, print to be, will affect the way that I expose, and I'll try to get that exposure as, as close to uh, you know, what I see in my head. Mm. Yeah, I think um, it's good to you know, like if you you are shooting a shot, just to say right, well I'm going to do this or have this in mind. Um, I guess you know, again with experience, you'll know exactly where you're going to go with an image. Yeah, there, there's, there's a photo I recently put up uh, from my New Zealand workshop with uh, from the Linda's Pass, a, a very dark um, photo of of, uh, of the road going through the mountains and and spotlight. And if you saw it, it didn't look quite like that. But um, I quite heavily underexposed it, and I sort of sh sort of showed um, you know, people on the workshop, just, you know what. What it looks like, he, you know, the landscapes before them. Then I show them what's on the LCD, and you know what's on the LCD is actually pretty close to what uh, what you see on on, on the website. Um, just uh, yeah, it's just just part of you know one of the things I like to do is to get uh, get the in camera as close as uh, as I can to the end product. Yeah, I, I saw that photo. I like um, how the foreground's quite dark, so it really uh, brings your eye into the middle of the image and the sort of spotlight of um, lights and the way the road leads into. Yeah, the so image. that was him. Sorry, so yeah, that was heavily underexposed um, to to get that sort of look. And um, you know, if you have a field, you look at the histogram, you think, oh, that's a horrible looking histogram, but uh, that was, <laughs> was deliberate. And that's with the Mark II. Yeah, that's with the Mark II. Uh, I, I was forced to use the 50 millimeter and 85 primes for for a while. Yeah, because um, I've got stuff rattling around in my 16 to 35. Yeah, cool. Uh, yeah. Lee, well, just to just to touch on what Jerome said earlier, um, we're, we're talking about processing, and I think it's really valuable that uh, I find myself sometimes up late working on an image, and then I wake up in the morning and I said, "What was I thinking?" And I think it's really, really valuable to come back to an image with fresh eyes and leave it for a day or two. And uh, I think that's a really great technique. Another uh, good technique or a good approach that I like to use is rather than uh, coming up with a raw image and just throwing a bunch of techniques that you know that, that I guess that usually work in other images and just throwing something at it and seeing if it works, what I tend to do is I try just create a little uh, sh uh, list of what things I think need to change in the image and where I want to see the image and uh, that might be things like, um, uh, I mean, it's as simple as a big net, but basically things that uh, I, I list down things where I, that need to be correct with the image and then with that list I basically use the, the tools at my disposal in Photoshop to then take my image um, down that uh, path. I just find that doing it that way is a lot more efficient and I find that I've got more direction and focus and I don't find like I'm going down one path, then reverting it, then starting again, then trying that, and I, I just find that's a lot more efficient and more, a lot more uh, focused. So it, it does pay, I think, to just observe the image, really, really look at it uh, in detail, and uh, note down what you think uh, needs to change. Yeah, I mean, I, myself, I only I tend to um, take 10 to 15 minutes to process an image. I, I don't spend a lot of time, um, but generally, I'm not exposure blending. If if I am, then it might take a bit longer. But I tend to uh, take longer on the images that I've I've stuffed up during capture, or where they weren't quite the right composition, or they weren't you know the landscape wasn't clean enough. That's when I'll spend the most time. But um, generally, I'm pretty quick as well. Um, and I like Photoshop. I use it a lot. So uh, and it's definitely an important part of the process. Um, just quickly. Um, yep. 
I'm just curious, uh, just among all of us, uh, are we all Photoshop users or are there people that uh, use Lightroom or other software? Photoshop, raise your hands. Photoshop. Yeah. Lightroom, Lightroom. I use Lightroom to catalog a lot of stuff, um, but that's about it. Bridge. Yeah. Uh, GIMP. <laughs> Automatics. <laughs> that's your moustache talking. <laughs> I have delved in it, but it never produces what I want, strangely enough. No, yeah. You're best uh, doing your HDR in Photoshop, I think. I um, think um, on this one, the um, Photoshop definitely probably for what we do, like you know, when you spend a lot of time on one image. I mean, obviously yeah. that doesn't quite work for you know wedding or sports photographers. So I got to shoot a few a few weddings as well, and uh, I quickly realized that my usual workflow was just not going to work. So I actually had at the time I didn't even have like because I used Capture, um, uh, Capture. Sorry, I used Aperture. And I actually had to get Lightroom to be able to process the photos from the wedding because I had obviously hundreds and thousands. And it's not going to do the trick. It's good in that respect for uh, processing lots of images. So, um, okay. And um, Ricardo, do you, you had a tutorial you want to share? I mean, uh, we're going to try and uh, keep this as quick as possible now. But um, do you, do you want to just provide a link to? Um, yeah. Uh, sure. The page on my website, and uh, maybe if, if people also subscribe to the email uh, subscription form there, um, you can send that out to everyone. But it was yeah. really interesting to see. Like, there's a dozen ways to skin a cat, isn't there, in Photoshop, really? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. There's a hell of a lot of ways to try and uh, reach the same outcome. Yeah, look, uh, uh, I've prepared a, a number of. Uh, uh, landscape techniques, a little bit more advanced is to try and not to tell the obvious, uh, which probably a lot of people are already aware of. So I've put together a little uh, document and I've also recorded a video. So I've just got that on my blog at the moment. So it's just my website. Uh, you might see it in the, uh, the details of this um, hangout. Um, basically all you have to do is just um, forward slash blog and that will take you to my latest uh, blog entry and it, it, you'll find that the, there's a link to the document there and a link to watch the uh, embedded video so um, yeah uh, but just in case Lee I'll just give you the link so you can post it on this uh, event. Um, look I do, go oh, ahead sorry. time doing that so thanks uh, for, for doing that. Oh no problems, no problems. I do have uh, a number of little techniques that I'd like to share but they're capture centred if now's a good time to share, share them with people. Uh, go for it. Yeah, yeah, I've just prepared a few of them and I've just uh, only got three really. Um, I just find that when I'm shooting panos, uh, I find it's very, very uh, useful to start from the opposite side of the rising sun and vice versa, start from the opposite side on the, uh, on the uh, setting sun. I just find that, that uh, when you're uh, dealing with uh, exposures of sometimes 30 seconds, if you, by the time you start from one side where the sun is and you finish at the other place, the light changes in a hell of a lot and the sun might be uh, low and hasn't risen yet and you'll start it off on the left hand side. By the time you do get close to the sun, you find the sun's risen and what your exposure reading was uh, two minutes ago is now very, very different and you find that you blow the highlights where the sun's rising. So I think it's always beneficial to start, whenever the sun's rising, start at where the um, start at where the sun is rising and then work your way so then when you do get to the darkest part of the image that sun uh, is, uh, would have risen and would have illuminated that section of the image so it just helps to get much much balanced exposures. I hope I've explained that right. Yeah. Uh, the I just said to go left to right but there you go. Yeah I, I find that uh, especially when you're shooting with ND filters trying to prolong the exposure perhaps potentially you're, you're trying to flatten the ocean because it's a pano and you want to you know that you're going to have issues trying to stitch the water well that's another thing when I'm shooting panos with the water I tend to whack on a, a three stop and a two or a two stop or even both uh, ND filter to really just flatten the oceans I find that when you're then trying to uh, stitch those images together later uh, yeah. it's just mu much easier so for that reason I mean a lot of the times I'm shooting at sunrise sunset so I find the light changes very very quickly um, second thing is in order to try and get the the water the water movement at its most optimum, um, it depends obviously on the how quick uh, water is uh, 
water's moving, but I find that one second or 0.8 of a second works really well to capture that nice detail and texture in the water. I find that I see a lot too many images that are shot with uh, excessive exposures and it just really washes out all the detail and it's just flat white spots and that's my opinion, I don't like that. I like to see an image with a lot of tech, uh, with that texture in the water. And uh, I find that something that really helps is just put your camera in burst mode and just uh, whack, uh, just keep your thumb on that uh, trigger on the remote and uh, then you've got the, uh, the flexibility to then review uh, the images later and pick the best one. Um, That's blasphemy, uh, burst mode. Yeah, bang, 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 yeah, who cares, you know, it's not costing you anything. Uh, obviously if you're in film it's a, a lot different, um, yeah. especially with your um, me uh, medium format, uh, you know, 6 by 17 you've only got the four, uh, four uh, slides per roll, so yeah, you can't afford to be doing that. Uh, I guess that's one of the advantages with digital. Um, the third thing uh, technique is um, I never, I always stray from using polarizers on a wide-angle lens uh, whenever I'm using the, uh, shooting the sky. I find that it, it really darkens one corner, uh, it doesn't darken the corners in proportion, and so you, I tend to find that one uh, corner is uh, very dark and the other one is it's just not balanced. And I find it's, it can be quite t difficult to try and remove that in post later and I find that you never really get an accurate result. So for that reason, I never use a polarizer on a wide angle lens when I'm shooting the sky and I'll just try and uh, replicate that uh, effect in Photoshop. Um, obviously if I'm shooting a waterfall and there is no sky, then I'll use a polarizer and that'll help me uh, try and cut through those reflections in the foliage or in the water. Um, uh, yeah, that's Go ahead. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. I uh, just wanted to quickly ask who uses a polarizing filter? Uh, not me. I don't know why I put my hand up. I actually I I would agree completely with uh, Ricardo's uh, uh, stance yes. on polarizers. Um, if there's any substantial amount of blue skies, uh, I don't use them on 16-35. How do you find them on for sunsets? Do you find it still unevenly or or uh, polarizes the sky? I pretty much will only use a polarizer if I want to look under the water. Yeah. Or so, there's. I mean, in, in general use, who uses a polarizing filter? In general, I, I won't use a polarizing filter unless there's a, unless there's a really good reason to use one. Um, I, I know there's this business of increasing saturation with the, with a polarizer or bringing out contrast in the sky, but that can be done um, post-processing and, and the uh, negative aspects of using a polarizer to me um, makes it not worthwhile. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Dylan, do you guys tend to use them, or we actually tend to use them a lot? But um, I think one of the things we learned was uh, learning to have the polarizer in different positions. Um, uh, as a tip, uh, if you there's usually a mark on the polarizer, and to get the maximum effect of the polarizer, you point it towards the light source. Um, and uh, if you do that with a plain blue sky, you're going to end up with a horrible sky that's going to be impossible to correct in post-processing. But um, in that situation, I usually leave the polarizer on and turn it off so it's not having an effect. Um, so, you know, you could just take it off, but I actually use polarizer a lot more than I don't. Um, in terms of, um, you know, what you can do with cloudy skies, um, if there's no plain colours in it, um, I find that it does bring out things that make it that much easier to post-process. But yeah, as everyone's been saying, plain blue skies, um, I try and avoid them uh, definitely. Yeah, it will definitely, it's definitely, definitely be a clouds. Clouds. it's just a grey sky. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I also find shooting into the sun, I, I do tend to take the polarizer off a lot, um, especially if I'm going for the sun flare shots, unless unless you keep your, all of your equipment religiously clean, um, I think any um, additional glass that you have uh, in between the sun and your the sensors is going to make it, um, or it gives you more opportunity to develop unusual flares and so forth. So if you're into shooting sun flares, then I think um, as a rule I try to use as little glass as possible in front of the uh, actual lens. Cool, cool. We had some questions from myself, um, but it's probably going on for a bit too long, and it was about competitions in the loop awards um, or, or just generally awards um, and what people's thoughts are. Maybe we, we should save that. That's probably a two-hour discussion in itself. Um, so let's leave that. Uh, I know people would love to hear about it, but really uh, we're going on for an hour and a half already. Um, I'll just, uh, as far as myself and what's happening next year, I'll just ask myself the question. Uh, 
be honest, I, I don't really know what's going on next year. Um, I don't have any plans. I know I'm getting married, so that's kind of uh, dictating what I do with photography. Thank you. Um, so I need to save my annual leave for work. I also need to save money. So whatever's in the, the photography bucket will be spent um, maybe in Namibia or maybe in England or maybe somewhere local. In fact, um, I just last weekend I went to the Blue Mountain Canyons. Um, I did want to just share that. I went at 7 in the morning. This is to Claustral Canyon in Blue Mountains. Beautiful place. Left at 7 in the morning. Didn't get back to my car until 1 in the morning. So I was out for 17 hours stuck in these canyons. So um, this is the second time whilst taking photos I've feared my life. Um, and I just think it's an important thing. Really, uh, looking back on it, is a photo worth it? Uh, no, it's not. Um, you know, so just be careful out there when you are taking photos, especially if you've got babies on your back. Um, so, one week out there for 17 hours. 17 hours. What's that? What's that? Why were you out there for 17 hours? Why was I out there? For 17 uh, hours. Because we missed the exit, or we basically walked above where the, the next canyon was, and um, we wasted about an hour trying to abseil back into it. So we ended up doing a 50 meter abseil um, on sunset. So, and it was really very scary. And then um, we proceeded to climb out of the canyon in the dark with head torches. Hmm. Is that out of something that that moved that uh, documentary? I shouldn't be alive. Well, we were thinking that, and uh, I mean, we had all the gear to stay the night, and uh, but we just thought we'd we'd try and um, to get out. And we had a couple of experienced guys with us. Um, unfortunately, they hadn't done the canyon before, but um, they had, um, you know, they had lots of experience with ropes, and uh, they they kept us alive, thankfully. And uh, if you're watching, thanks very much. I'm glad I could be here. Um, so uh, let's um, see if we can answer any questions or uh, even critique some photos. Um, if people want to just uh, quickly post a link onto onto my website, um, so the Google, uh, sorry, the Hangout page um, in the Facebook comments, just just post a link to to a photo you'd like us to quickly look at, um, and we'll just pick a couple of them and uh, give them a quick review. So first, in best dressed. Do you guys want to, uh, if you can jump on there as well, you can have a look. Um, and if anyone sees one, can they let me know? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe someone else can talk while uh, I've, I dig out something. We're we'll talking about the Loop Awards. Anyone entered the Loop Awards? Yes, we have. And what, what, and your, what, thought, what your thought? I'll, I'll give you um, my answer in... Three numbers, 95, 90, 70. And that's, uh, that's about all I have at the moment in terms, until we get all of our feedback back. Um, but we, we just found it a little bit frustrating that um, in uh, you know, the awards where they're ranking images from bronze to silver to gold to platinum, um, that some people think your pictures are worthy of a platinum and possibly winning it, and yet, uh, yet the same judge sitting next to them think they're worth trash and nothing at all. And that's a little bit, I know art's subjective, but um, you know, um, you think that there might be some kind of um, calibration process to present such a wide variance. Um, you know, um, I don't know, I don't have any experience in judging at all, um, but it's just a, um, a bit of a knee-jerk reaction at all. So I'll have to sit back and digest that once the whole process is done. And reflect on it, and think whether or not that is a, um, uh, I guess, a valid process to go through. But at the moment, um, it's a bit of a knee-jerk reaction, so I realise it may not be the right reaction. Um, but I think that's a lot of experience people are having at the moment. Just a bit of frustration with the high variance of scores. I'm not involved, I'm not involved in, in the loop uh, competition, but it sounds a little bit strange compared to a lot of the other uh, judging processes where. Um, the other competitions I've been involved with, with the, it seems much more like a, like a jury that, you know, everyone goes around in circles until they, 
they all agree on something. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I got back, and I, for me, it was a fair result, and um, and you know, I got a a bronze in the professional category. I mean, it was judged uh, fine, I thought, um, but you know, I don't know, I, I, I don't have, and the feedback I got was fine as well. I think it was a, a valid comment, but um, we'll see what my other prints do and and how we get on. So, um, I'm going to share a photo. Fingers crossed. Technology, come on. Okay, so, um, and then if you guys can just uh, make some comments on it, so you can see that, yeah. Uh, just loading. Yeah, so, I can, I can see it. Okay, so this is from someone. Um. Do you want to? This is from Jake Anderson. Ricardo, would you like to to go first? Oh, it's a pretty strong image already. Uh, so, uh, um, let me just. I've just lost it temporarily. Just bear with me. Can we throw it to someone else? I've just lost it temporarily. Uh, sure. Anyone? Here we go. I've got it. I've uh, got it back. Sorry. Start if you want. Um, go first, your room. Make a, a comment actually about who submitted it because I actually know him. And uh, I can tell you, tell you an interesting story about Jack because he actually quite he, he scared me a little bit because um, he lives in the Blue Mountains and he actually came to one of my workshops and he decided that he would drive from the Blue Mountain at 4 a.m. in the morning to get there on the coast in Sydney for sunrise. I wasn't too comfortable with that. Um, but after two Marquez on the way, I think he was pretty much fine. And Looking at this image, uh, I really like it. I think there's a lot of action in it. Uh, I think the proportions are right. I really like the water movement, and um, I've seen his work previously, and he's definitely massively improved. Um, the few things that I would tweak is, um, to me, it looked like there's, there's something with the horizon. Either there's still a bit of distortion that could be removed, um, and maybe there's a, a little bit too much rock on the, on the right. It looks like it's a bit stretched horizontally. It's actually not a, a proper 2 by 3 ratio. But that I really like the comments. I really like the image. That might be something to do with Google Hangout, but uh, yeah, I can see um, now you say the horizon is slightly um, bar or distorted with barrel distortion, but um, yeah, it's a great image. But uh, Jake, thumbs up. That's a really cool image. Really like it. Yeah. Like it a lot. Something easy, Lee. <laughs> What's that? I said, give us something easy that we can pick on. And uh, these ones are too good. <laughs> well, that's what I thought. Um, okay. Well, I, I'm, I'm trying. I don't know if uh, any of you guys can see it or on the yep. internet, freaking out. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm okay with the proportions of rock. Um, the exposure is good. Good, uh, interesting water motion. Um, I think my only criticism would be. There's a lot of very bright white water. Um, that I, I wonder whether um, processing for the bright areas could bring a bit more texture out there. Um, that's about it. It's a great image, though. Yeah. That's yeah. That's feedback. Feedback. Yeah, I really like the image as well. The overall exposure is really good and. Um, I really like the shutter speed, especially that crash of wave on, on the right-hand side. Um, and I reckon there's a good amount of rock as well, and the hint of orange is really good too. Um, but uh, as just, a, I guess, a really minor thing as, and as a personal thing, um, a lot of seascapes where um, colour effects are applied to the whole image, uh, um, you kind of notice that the water goes really blue or something. Um, it may just be the way it appears here, but. Um, just as a personal thing, I, I usually kind of try and tone down cyans and blues in the water, unless that's the way the, the prevailing light's actually showing. So that would be my only kind of tiny criticism about it. If I can make uh, just one further comment, something that I really like about this image as well is that I don't know where that is. Um, and uh, I've got to be honest, for seascapes uh, around Australia, if it's around Australia, I usually recognize the place very quickly, but I just don't know where this is. Which is good. 
Yeah, it's very good. I guess it's on the coast somewhere. Um, okay, I've got another one. The suspense. Is that you inside the canyon, Lee? <laughs> Is that your one, Lee? You're tricking us. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was, yeah, I'm trying to find some other ones, so I thought I'd chuck that up there. But um, oh well, if we're we're struggling to get images, uh, maybe it's just uh, from the the um, the, the technology is not working. But maybe we'll just wrap it up there, and um, you know, I might hang out on uh, on the the Facebook comments there for a bit later and uh, for a bit longer, sorry, and just answer some some questions if anyone has them. Um, be sure to subscribe to all of our Facebook pages and uh, blogs. All the links are on uh, within the the um, uh, hangout description. So just be sure to check them out. And uh, thanks everyone for coming along. I um, appreciate you taking the time to speak to everyone, and hopefully people got something out of it. Um, so I, I I mean I would love to do this again. Maybe we'll uh, we'll we'll talk about competitions or some other stuff some other time and. Uh, and uh, try and keep it to one topic. So, anyway, cheers. Uh, thanks very much. I'll I'll kill the, the connection now. Well, thanks Thank very much. You. Thanks, Luke. Thanks for hosting.